Cup. Right now he's Roba doing Terry Funk in a violent elbow. Sends him right out of the ring. The date is August 20th, 2005, the latest installment of the HighSpots.com shoot interview series with Baron Von Rasky. Here to tell us all that the people need to know. Uh, first question, tell us about your amateur background uh, in Nebraska. Well, if you uh, insist, I, I was, <laughs> I, I, I really hate to talk about myself, but okay, sure. Anyway, uh, uh, for those of you that aren't clear, I'm not. I'm not Ben Affleck. I look like him, but I'm not Ben Affleck. So quit asking for Ben Affleck's autograph. I grew up uh, in Nebraska, Omaha. I went to the University of Nebraska. When I was in high school, I was a state champion in amateur wrestling. I uh, played football and wrestled at the uh, University of Nebraska. I'm a Cornhusker through and through, still a big fan, even though the program's gone south. And I didn't mean that in a negative way, but there you are. Anyway, uh, uh, I was a big A champion, and I went on, and I won the national AAU title in Greco and in freestyle, and then I was uh, on the Olympic team, but unfortunately, I got injured and didn't quite make the trip to Tokyo back in 1964, before most of you were born. Tell us a little bit about that qualifying for the Olympics and then the injury that you, that you sustained that kept you out of the 64 games. Well, in 64, uh, I was uh, at the top of my game, so to speak, and... Uh, I beat everybody in the tournament. I, I, uh, I won the right to go to the Olympics, but at the training camp, which was held in uh, Annapolis, Maryland, at the Naval Academy, back when Roger Staubach was still the quarterback there at the Navy, at Navy, uh, I was wrestling with uh, Bob Pickens, a guy that I'd beaten five times in, in my amateur career, and uh, and uh, he uh, applied an illegal hold and. Uh, Hyperextended my elbow, it swelled up like a big balloon, and I couldn't bend my arm. And uh, the plane was going to leave for Tokyo in a couple of days, and they said, uh, that's too bad. So back then, they had the ABC Wide World of Sports, and they always showed the guy coming down the ski slope, and he fell down and crashed, and boom. And it said, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, while well, my feet really hurt. From there, what led to your decision to enter professional wrestling? Bad luck. Detail. Details. More details. Oh, details. Okay, back uh, back then. Uh, I, back then, actually, I was in the uh, army. I was serving uh, two years. I was drafted into the army, and uh, it was two of the best years of my life because they let me wrestle amateur wrestling. And uh, uh, at the end of that. Uh, time, I, I, I had made the Olympic team, and then I got hurt, and then I was off the Olympic team, and then I was several more months in the Army, and I decided I should, uh, this was another injury. I was messing around with a guy at the New York ACL station in Brooklyn, New York, in the, uh, at uh, Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn, New York, and I'd go down to the uh, New York AC and work out. I was working out with a I wasn't really working out with him. I was just fooling around with a guy that weighed 147 pounds. I'm 237 at the time, and we were just fooling around. I got my foot caught in the mat the wrong way and blew my knee out and had to have an operation. So they put me in a hospital in Queens. The, I was in the Army. They put me in the Queens Naval Hospital in uh, Queens, New York, and they operated on me. And the same day they operated on me, they operated on a guy in the next bunk, John Cunningham, who was from Long Island. He was a submariner in the Navy, and uh, John was a big professional wrestling fan, and I, I had never been. I was into my amateur wrestling. I was focused on amateur wrestling, and uh, every Saturday or whenever it was on, he would drag me down to the TV room, and we'd watch uh, the wrestling from New York, Vince McMahon Sr.'s wrestling, and uh, Dr. Jerry Graham and some of those Big names back then were on, and I kept watching it. I think, thinking with my background and stuff, this is something I might be able to do, you know. And, uh, up to that time, I'd never made over $1,200 in a, any single year being in college and in the Army. So uh, I wrote to the uh, promoter whose name I knew in, in Omaha, 
Nebraska, my hometown, and uh, Joe Dusick, and uh, actually Joe Dusick's brother, Rudy Dusick, owned the New York Territory before Vince McMahon Sr. owned it. They bought it. He bought it from Rudy, I believe. Anyway, uh, which has nothing to do with anything, but uh, Joe was a pretty good guy anyway. And I, I wrote to him. I didn't know him, and I wrote to him just a, a cold, cold call letter and uh, gave him my background and this, that, and the other. And he wrote me back a nice letter. He said, you know, if you're still interested when you get out of the Army, give me a call, and we'll see what we can do. And uh, meantime, I thought, well, I don't know. I maybe I started thinking. And I had gotten a degree in teaching, so I, uh, I applied for some teaching jobs in my hometown of Omaha, and uh, I was called in for an interview, and I got a teaching job. So when I got out of the Army, I uh, taught school for a year, and, uh, and uh, I still had the bug to try uh, this professional wrestling. It was either that or a uh, semi-pro football team. Anyway, uh, I contacted Joe Dusick again, and he, he had me come down to a TV show. They had a TV show, local in uh, local TV show on Channel 7 in Omaha. And I went down, I met him, and I met, uh, the first time I met him, I met him, and I met some of the wrestlers, and uh, Vern Gagne happened to be there, and Vern Gagne took an interest and said if I wanted to try out or was serious about it, come up to Minnesota and... Uh, he would do what he could with me and see, what, see if I had what it took. So a uh, few days or weeks later, whatever it was, I uh, borrowed my little brother's car because I didn't own a car and uh, drove up to Minnesota. And after they let me sit for f three or four weeks, they finally, uh, uh, I met up with Vern again. and. Uh, I went to the wrestling office, met Wally Carbo and uh, G Bill Casisto, who were running the office. And finally, uh, Vern had me come out to his uh, farm, which was a uh, place where he eventually, he had trained wrestlers there before, and he eventually trained a lot of wrestlers uh, later. Ricky Steamboat's one of those people, and uh, Ken Batera is one of those people, and the uh, the Sheik from New York, uh, whose name is, escapes me now because I'm an older guy. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, Chris Taylor was one of this, those guys too. But I, it was just me and Vern at this time. This was before that, and uh, back in 1966. And uh, he uh, he was nice enough to start me in wrestling and. Uh, Apparently, I had some of the qualities he was looking for, and he uh, gave me the job of setting up the ring and refereeing. So I did that for several months. And during that time, one of my duties was to set up the ring at the TV studio at the Calhoun Beach Hotel in Minneapolis. That's where they did their weekly television show, which they taped the show, and they, that was for the minneapolis St. Paul area, and then they, they, uh, they bicycled it out to the various towns in the AWA, and that's how uh, wrestling was promoted in that area, uh, which I didn't know at the time, but now I know. But anyway, during that period of time, uh, I was still learning the business, so I, I would be stuck into this uh, little control booth area, which was a dark room where all the TV cameras are, and the director, Al Darusha, would push buttons and say, camera one, camera two, camera one, camera two, and he would get the best pictures, and he was very good at that. And they, they produced a quite a quite a good show, but uh, sitting in this dark room, way in the back, and in the hallway, which was lit, I could see this lit door out out from where I sat, and the wrestlers would go back, go from the dressing room, which was downstairs. They'd take an elevator up, and go into the ring. And uh, one week after several weeks, uh, this little, not little, but this. Bald head peered in the doorway and his ferocious face, and it says, You'd make a good German! I was a young, naive guy. I didn't know what, it, what it, this was. You know, I had never met this guy and didn't know who he was. And he went to the ring, and it, it was El Destructo. Boom, ba boom, ba boom, boom. Action everywhere, boom. Just fantastic. And off he went. 
you know, I was just too afraid to even speak to the guy. So uh, the next week, uh, this particular person had been out of the territory for a while, but he'd come back. Okay, so uh, the next week I did set up the ring. I went back in the control booth like I was supposed to, watch the wrestling. And this is how I was learning some of the wrestling, plus the refereeing I was doing, this, that, and the other. But anyway, uh, again, the bald head appeared in the dressing room, this fierce face. You make a good German. That's all he said. <laughs> Off the ring, more destruction, more mayhem. Super, super just uh, fascinated me just watching this guy in the ring because he just, just tore up the ring and uh, got everybody excited. So after about three or four times, uh, finally I got worked up the courage. He said, you didn't make a good German. I said, well, I am German. And... Uh, he kind of laughed. He went to the ring and he did the same thing. Tore up the ring, boom, boom, boom. Chairs flying, furniture, hair, blood, everything. So after uh, that was that, and then uh, uh, during the week I would be setting up the ring in different little towns and refereeing the matches and running the shows for the office. And uh, this was my rookie, rookie year. And... Uh, so this guy was on the card, and it happened to be Mad Dog Vashon, which folks in most parts of the wrestling world would know his name. And he's quite a character, and he uh, became a very, very good friend of mine. And he's, uh, him and I, uh, I refereed his matches, and, and uh, we got to talking in the dressing room. And uh, back then, I still had side walls. That was my due. I had a little bit of hair, and uh, he said, I'm going up to Montreal. I need a partner. You want to come? I said, well, sure, because I didn't know any better. And uh, so uh, a few days later, I shaved the rest of my side, side walls, which took me about two, two and a half seconds. And uh, I was a young guy, but I didn't have much hair. Anyway. Uh, uh, and I just, during this interim, I had just gotten married to my wife, Bonnie, and who we now call Mrs. Claw, by the way. And my daughter's the pinch. But anyway, we took off for uh, Montreal. We loaded up our Mustang, filled it up with all of our belongings, two rubber tree plants and some uh, clothes, and we headed up to Montreal, Canada. And I was so naive and, and dumb, I didn't realize that uh, quite a bit of Canada, they speak only French. And Montreal is more, more uh, metropolitan than that. They speak English and French. But uh, uh, it was quite an awakening for me, for this uh, kid from Nebraska. Anyway, uh, I got up to Montreal and uh, was introduced to the promoter, Jack Britton, and, and Johnny Rougeau, and uh, Mad Dog and I became a team. And uh, with his experience... And his size, he's not as tall as I am. He's, he's uh, fairly short, but very stocky and very tough. He was also a, an ex-Olympian. He represented Canada in the Olympics at one time. And, uh, and uh, with my good looks and charm, we made a, a great team. Just physically, the contrast was good. And, and just walking to the ring, we just, uh, the people didn't care for us too much. Which was good because we uh, we we reacted to that and uh, made it made it happen. Actually, Mad Dog reacted to it, and I followed him. And anyway, one thing led to another, and we uh, we were kind of the sensation of the territory at the time. Tell us a little bit about that first run in Montreal. Well, it was uh, uh, it turned out to be very very good. We uh, popped the territory. It had been down for a number of years. Uh, Eddie Quinn had passed away, and the territory had died, and, and uh, uh, wrestling, wrestling was always a, a very big thing in, in, in the uh, Montreal, the Quebec area. And, uh, but then for years, it had lain dormant. It was, uh, there wasn't much action at all. Nobody was really promoting it as, a, as an entity. So when Johnny Rougeau and Jack Britton took it over, they... Uh, they brought in the Mad Dog, who was a legend. He's a legend there for, for many years. Uh, people knew him 
because he was uh, not only a tough guy, but he was street tough, and he had a reputation on the streets and various things. They knew he was for real, and uh, they brought me up as his partner. So with his heat, that's what we call it in the business, heat. He had a ton of heat, and that that uh, fell onto me too. And uh, uh, as a result, I got over just terrific over up there and. Uh, uh, after a few weeks, we were selling out everything. The hockey season was over, and they concentrated on the wrestling. And uh, Montreal, Shikutsumi, Ramuski, Trois Rivieres, we were selling out uh, night after night. Who are you working? What else with? you want to know, Herr Brad? Who are you working with at the time in your your first year or so in the business in that territory? Uh, who was I working with? Uh, Edouard Carpence, Johnny Rougeau. Uh, uh, Gino Brito, uh, who later came here for a while. I don't know where we are. Anyway, uh, uh, all the great ones. Uh, Johnny Valentine came through there, uh, Killer Kowalski, uh, Dr. Big Bill Miller, Danny Miller. Uh, you name them, they, they came through the Montreal Territory at the time because we it had popped and everybody wanted to go there because it was there were big houses and money to be made. Where did you go from Montreal? Uh, from Montreal, I went to Detroit, worked for Eddie Farhat, the Sheik, the original Sheik. What were your memories the guy of working fire. in Detroit? <laughs> what, were your memories of, what were your memories of working in Detroit? I don't remember anything. You can't make me tell. Uh, it was a great experience too, and uh, uh, whatever happened in Montreal, I actually learned. Uh, learned my craft uh, working with these great workers that were up there and uh, everybody helped me, you know, and uh, uh, so then, then I was down in Detroit and I was working with Boba Brazil and uh, uh, all the great workers were coming to Detroit because it was a hot territory at the time too. Uh, and I got, I got over again and it was, uh, it was a great run. From there, if, if, I, if my research is correct, you went to St. Louis from there? And uh, I had one shot in St. Louis from there. And met Pat O'Connor, who... I did. ...passed along something that you would carry with you for the rest of your career. Well, yeah, as it happened, I... Uh, at the time I was in Montreal, uh, somebody suggested that I use the uh, standing backbreaker, which is you pick a guy up and you go like this, and you finish him off and drop him behind you, and... Uh, that was getting over really, really good, and so I kept using it, and I used it in Detroit, and, and uh, it was a great hold for me, a great finishing hold, and I was getting to be identified with it a little bit. But anyway, I was called to go to uh, St. Louis. Apparently, Pat O'Connor, somebody had heard about it, and uh, I wound up working with Pat O'Connor, and my experience there was uh, we worked at Keel Auditorium, which is famous, and St. Louis is one of the main focuses of the, of the uh, NWA. It was the seat of the NWA championship, and uh, uh, Luthez had it. Uh, uh, Pat O'Connor had it at one time. Uh, Dory Funk had it. Dory, uh, uh, Terry Funk had it. Uh, Jack Briscoe had it, Harley Races had it, uh, uh, who's the big Canadian guy? It's Kanitsky. Oh yeah, Gene Kanitsky, he had it. And uh, you know, it was, a, it was a, a historic belt to have and it was, that, was, that was the office for that belt and it went around most of the country, even into uh, all the, all the southern territories, the northern territories, it was everywhere. And uh, uh, Stranger Lewis had it for, you know, that's going way back. All these, a lot of these guys are before my time. But anyway, it was uh, historically a very important town. And they invited me there to, to wrestle, and it turned out I had to wrestle Pat O'Connor. And then when we were in the ring, uh, we were having just a, what I thought was a terrific match, and I think Pat liked it too, and uh, the people, of course, liked it. Oh. On my way to the ring, though, I got lost. I, uh, I don't see very well, and that's re the reason that people sometimes don't understand what a nice guy I am, because I'm squinting and I'm trying to find my way around. 
And uh, all the wrestlers went in the same way. But I didn't know that. I was upstairs in the dressing rooms, came down, and I saw Pat O'Connor go this way, so I went across this big stage in the, in the dark, and I found the doorway on the other side, and I went out that way. There were no cops there, nothing. I, so I walked in the wrong way. I was frustrated. I was trying to find the ring, and I was stumbling and fumbling. And, and just in doing that, everybody thought I was crazy and didn't, didn't care for me at all, and they were booing and hissing. And, Anyway, I made my way to the ring, and, and uh, uh, getting back to Pat O'Connor, we, we were having a great match, and during the match, he said, put the claw on me, put the claw on me. He didn't talk like that. Let's see. He said, put the claw on me, put the claw on me. <laughs> he did that a lot. Anyway, so I says, what's the claw? Because I didn't know. I'd never seen it. I hadn't been exposed to the claw, and uh, uh, he just said, well, grab my head with your hand. So he didn't talk like that either. So I, I uh, put the claw on him. I grabbed his head with my hand, and the people went, whoa! It was like they took all the air out of the room. I didn't, I didn't even realize what I'd done. So I grabbed his head as hard as I could, and I held on to it as best I could, and I stayed with him as he went, and eventually, uh, we were in and out of the sleeper and the claw. And, and uh, anyway, to make a uh, short story long, it turned out to be a big, big uh, success. And uh, I went back to Detroit. I actually lived in Toledo, but the Detroit territory. I went back to the Detroit territory and went back to using the backbreaker. Kidneys, kidneys. Anyway, I used the backbreaker, and then I. Uh, I had a chance to go to uh, Dallas, Texas, and I, I worked in Fritz von Erich's territory. He was the promoter, and uh, of course, Fritz von Erich was famous for the claw. And uh, at the same time, uh, Don Jardine, the spoiler, was there with uh, Gary Hart as his manager, and they had a ton of heat. And, and uh, so, you know, they were there, and they had the claw, and I had the standing backbreaker which I kept using, kept using, and uh, got over, and there I met, a, actually I met uh, Dusty Rhodes in, in Toledo, he came through and actually shared our, my wife and I, his, his wife and, and him shared my wife and our new baby's uh, trailer for a few weeks. And uh, anyway, we, were, we got to be good friends, and then I met him again in, in uh, Dallas, the Dallas Territory, Texas Territory, and uh, they uh, teamed us up, Dusty and I, and we, we had a nice tag team. And, and we, uh, we got over in our own way, and I was still using the standing backbreaker, and then I, I went up uh, to work for Dick the Bruiser and Wilbur Snyder in, in Indianapolis. You can interrupt any time to ask questions. Not at all. Okay, so we, I went up to uh, Indianapolis, and... Uh, Dick the Bruiser and Wilbur Snyder were the uh, promoters, and I worked with them a lot during that time. Moose Jolock, uh, Cowboy Bob Ellis, uh, Bobo came around. Ernie Ladd was there a lot. Anyway, uh, when I first went up there, uh, Pat O'Connor was coming through, and uh, he also worked in and out with Dick once in a while, not very often. And he, he talked to Dick, and he said, told him how this match had gotten over with the claw and blah, blah, blah. And so, so they suggested that I start using the claw as a finishing hold, and uh, so I did. I started using it, and uh, I noticed that uh, Fritz von Erich and uh, Don Jardine, when they did it, they all of a sudden it just came out of the blue, and, uh, and it, that worked for them. It was great, but mine was a l little slower version, and... Uh, I tried to make it a little more dramatic, and it worked for me. And uh, since that time, that's been my finishing hold. And if I didn't do it during a match, uh, people were disappointed. And uh, if I did do it, they were equally disappointed. Memories of working for Dick the Bruiser in Indianapolis. What was that question? Memories of working for Dick the Bruiser in Indianapolis. Well, he beat me so bad, I, I can't remember. But. Uh, uh, those were fun years. I, uh, you know, uh, Blackjack Lanza, uh, 
Blackjack Mulligan and uh, a host of other Moose Cholak, I mentioned him, but just a, a ton of ton of good talent came through there and uh, uh, Dick kept beating me up every year and uh, usually a heel only lasted there about a year and he, then, he, then I'd be revived the next year and I'd go on for another. So I was there for about five years and uh, just a great experience. Uh, short trips and uh, which is very important in the wrestling business, short trips and uh, uh, decent pay and uh, meanwhile I could work other territories. I started working Kansas City out of there and uh, it was, a, it was a, a good four, four or five years that I worked for Dick and Wilbur. While you were there... Except for Moose Cholak, of course. That's why I walk like I walk and talk like I talk. But. Memories of working with Moose. Oh, it's very scary. Moose, Moose was a terror. He was uh, a, a huge guy. He weighed 400 and some pounds and 6'4", six, 6'5", six, whatever he was. and. A lot of energy, and he didn't know what he was doing with it. It just come crashing down on everybody. I remember one time uh, he worked. He worked a six-man tag team, and he hurt everybody on the other team, all three of those guys, and both of his partners and the referee in the same match. That was Moose Cholak. But he was, you know, he was Moose. He was he was a great performer. He just uh, a little careless with other people's bodies. While you were in especially mine. While you were in Indianapolis, you worked with a young Bobby Heenan when he was first starting out. What were your impressions of him when he was first starting out in the business? Oh, he was, hey, from day one, from day, the time I met him, he was great. He was just so good on the mic, and he could just talk and uh, get a ton of heat. He's so witty and sharp, and, and uh, he was my manager at, uh, uh, at at the time I was in Indianapolis, and we got to be very, very, very good friends. We're friends to this day. And uh, uh, he was just a sensational manager, but he also became such a great worker. He was just a, a tremendous worker. He could do it all. Bobby, Bobby's great. He, he was great, and he got better, and uh, uh, he's been sensational. While you were in Indianapolis. Read the book. Huh? I, I plan to. While you were in Indianapolis, you teamed with a man you would cross paths with later, Jimmy Valiant. Um, what are your memories of that run teaming with Jimmy Valiant in the early 70s, I guess, late 60s in Indianapolis? Uh, Jimmy, J both Jimmy and Johnny were there, actually. Jimmy uh, came first and Johnny Valiant. And uh, they're, they're both characters. They're, they're, they were a dynamic but strange duo and uh, always interesting. Uh, but both good workers. I, I don't know what, what more to say about it. Johnny's always funny, and Jimmy is always chimmy. You were also Strange. you were also on a tag team with Ernie Ladd oh, in, yeah. in Indianapolis. What are your memories of working with Ernie Ladd? Uh, Ernie and I got along great. He was, uh, you know, he's a big guy, ex-football player, Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, uh, when, uh, and he was just, uh, he was one of the first uh, big money football players. Uh, huge guy, great athlete, and uh, uh, good businessman. He was just uh, big Ernie, big red, big red. He was red. What were your thoughts working in Chicago for Bob Luce? who really pushed the envelope with your character and, and really tried to tie in the Nazi symbolism and the Hitler symbolism into your character? Uh, yeah, I never, uh, I'm not a Nazi and I don't think along those lines. I'm not a skinhead, although I don't have any hair. I'm not a skinhead. But uh, yeah, Bob was, uh, Bob Luce was the uh, front, front man for the promotion and he, uh, he did push the envelope with, the, with several things that were contrary to what I would have liked, but uh, uh, you got to realize that Bob started out as a typewriter salesman. Turned out he was a great typewriter salesman, and then he became a uh, tabloid newspaper publisher back before it was even, even 
minusculely regulated. And he would say, he would, he's the guy that would produce these horrible headlines that made everybody want to buy that paper. So, you know, he's, uh, he's coming from, that's where he came from, so. Uh, I don't know. I, uh, personally, he was, he was an all right guy, but he was strange. You went to Pittsburgh uh, very sporadically to work with Bruno San Martino. What are your memories of that? Oh, that's, uh, Bruno was, uh, you know, he's always been a gentleman and always a, a great asset to the business. He's a big, strong guy and uh, always performed well. And uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, we had great matches, him and I, and sold out Pittsburgh a few times. And uh, later, uh, later uh, when I was working for Vince McMahon Sr., uh, uh, we worked in the garden together. He was, uh, he was always a gentleman, a great performer, good to work with. Right around this time, you made your first trip to Japan. Uh, what are your memories of the early tours in Japan, the first couple of times that you went and wrestling in Japan for the first time? Uh, Japan was... Uh, well, it was a new experience, a great experience, actually, because uh, I was geared to go to uh, Tokyo in 1964 on the Olympic team, and I didn't make it. So I got to go to Tokyo later as a professional wrestler, and uh, it was uh, very interesting. The culture and everything was very interesting. Back then, the, uh, the uh, economy wasn't quite what it was today, and... Uh, Things were a little more pr primitive. We had to travel in a little mini bus most of the time. And uh, 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 you slept mostly in Japanese style motels, which means you pulled the mattresses. You didn't, but the maids pulled the mattresses out of the closet, slept on the floor on a rice, uh, rice filled mattress with a rice pillow. And one of the guys woke up with, the, kept hearing noises. He thought he was going crazy, and there was a mouse in his pillow. But uh, things like that. It was a little, little primitive, you know. You, you didn't have the uh, uh, toilet facilities that you have here. And it was, uh, the water's good, though. And the shower was always good. And the bath was always good. So uh, it was a great experience. It was just uh, learning a different culture. And, and uh, you, you wrestled a little different style. It was a lot uh, closer work than what we did here. But good. Do you remember any other uh, Americans or top guys from here that would have been on those early tours with you? Oh, sure. Uh, Andre the Giant, he, you've heard of him, I think. Once or twice. Yeah, uh, big guy. Uh, Andre the Giant, uh, Don Leo Jonathan. I actually met my uh, a future partner of mine, Horst Hoffman there. He's a German, uh, German guy. And, uh, uh, I was there with all of them, Dusty Rhodes and uh, Dory Funk Jr. and... Uh, Oh, Dick Murdoch, wild man, great guy, and good friend of mine, wonderful friend of mine. Uh, Any stories about Murdoch in Japan? Uh, I don't know. He just, uh, he was always fun, always uh, wild and crazy. I, I, you know, I, I can't remember anything specifically on short notice, but if I think about it, ask me tomorrow. Um, you mentioned briefly that you met your partner in Japan and later took that back to the AWA where you had started out. What are your memories and, and just kind of talk us through how that came about going back to the AWA? Well, actually, uh, I met Horst uh, in Japan and uh, him and I got along real good. We used to walk from our hotel, which is quite away from the Ginza. We'd walk all the way to the Ginza and we'd spend the days together when we had days off, which weren't that many, but uh, we got along really, really good. And, I was interested in him because he was German, and we could, I could practice my uh, not so good German with him, and it got a little better. But uh, uh, we just hit it off. We were good friends, and uh, and then he went back to Germany, and I went back to the States, and I was still working for Bruiser then, I think. And eventually, I went to Minneapolis. And uh, meanwhile, the uh, I think it was the '72 Olympics. Uh, Vern Gagne had gone to the 72 Olympics, and uh, that's where he met Ken Patera and, uh, and Chris Taylor and, and brought them into the business. But uh, 
he also met Horst Hoffman, who was a, a big, uh, big name over there in pro, pro wrestling. And he asked him to come. And uh, the, the office, the Minneapolis office, actually teamed us up together. And it just, just worked out to be really good. He had a, a different style. The Europeans work a little differently than we did. And uh, uh, we kind of complemented each other. And I kind of knew what we needed here. And he kind of knew what he could do. And uh, we got over it. It was great. Memories of feuding with Superstar Graham and Dusty Rhodes in that run. Superstar and Dusty. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, Superstar, of course, was one of the early uh, uh, muscle guys to get over in professional wrestling. There had been a few previous to that, but no, nobody got over quite like he did. He, he, he had to... Uh, he had the talk. He could talk the talk and walk the walk. And, uh, and of course, Dusty was just coming on the scene, and he was uh, turning into be the, being a really, really great worker. Him and I had been partners in Dallas by then, and he'd gone on, and he'd hooked up with Murdoch, and Murdoch was a sensational worker from day one. And uh, uh, when he, they hooked him up with Superstar, we just uh, we had some great contests. It was, how did it feel to be back in the AWA right around that time? And how did Vern take to you someone that had trained there and then gone and become more seasoned and then came back? What was kind of Vern's attitude towards you at the time? Well, Vern, uh, Vern's a, first of all, Vern's a very good businessman. And he, uh, he, he realized that what he'd put together with Horst and I was good. and. And of course, that that was his main focus and impetus, and and uh, we we made some money for him. So I think he was happy with us. You know, I don't. You know, I don't. Vern broke me into business. I owe him a lot for that. And uh, uh, but we've never been uh, like. Uh, you know, he doesn't drop into my house, and I don't drop into his house. And he's you know we're we're business acquaintances, but we're not necessarily personal friends. But uh, I like Vern a lot, and he's done a lot for me. I, you know, some people knock him for what he, because he's the boss. But uh, uh, I just regarded him as my boss, and I worked for him and did the best I could. That's what I do for anybody. What led to you debuting in the WWWF in 1975-76? More bad luck. <laughs> well, it was uh, time for me. Uh, Horst wanted to go back to Germany, so he did. And then I was uh, in, uh, in Minneapolis at the time, and uh, eh, it was about time for me to go, too. So uh, I got the call. Uh, I had been, you know, I'd, I, as you said, I'd worked with Bruno before in Pittsburgh. And uh, actually, I think I called him. I'm not sure. But uh, one thing led to another, and they, they said that uh, they wanted me to come to New York, so I wound up going there thinking it would be a good opportunity, and it worked out so-so. Uh, what led to you going from there, making your debut in the Mid-Atlantic area against Giant Baba? Well, that was, uh, you know, unbeknownst to me, I was working in, uh, in New York, and apparently somebody from... Uh, Baba's office or Mid-Atlantic. Well, I actually, I think it was Dory Funk Jr., to tell you the truth. Uh, Dory Funk Jr., uh, I think he was responsible. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, got a, I got called uh, by Vince McMahon Sr. to uh, come down, and, and uh, uh, he asked me if I wanted to go to Greensboro, North Carolina. I said, Sure, he says. Well, I said, sure, you know. Uh, he said, they want you to work with uh, Giant Baba. I said, okay, you know, I don't care. So I flew down there, and not knowing that uh, Baba was touring the country at that time, working different places, and I was going to be featured with Baba in this match, which was, and Baba was new to the territory, so nobody in Greensboro knew who he was, nobody knew who I was. And you're talking about a, a, a big, ugly guy and another big, ugly guy. He's about four or five inches taller than I am. But uh, 
so who's going to be the heel? Well, I, I kind of made sure it was me. And I went out and uh, got the people. I went out first, so I got the people all excited about me. And, and uh, then Baba came out, and they were kind of glad to see him, just to get this maniac off their, out of their sight or whatever. And uh, we had a really, really good match, Baba and I, and uh, just a wrestling match, basically a wrestling match. And, and uh, it got over really good. And it turned out that I wasn't working for the Carolina office. I was working for Baba's group. And his group paid me, and they paid me very well, which was a big surprise to me because I didn't know that. And then, uh, then I went off back to New York, and I finished out my thing and was finishing out my thing in New York. And then, uh, then I got called to, uh, to come to Charlotte, to the Charlotte area for uh, Jimmy Crockett and, uh, and uh, George Scott. So. So I thought, well, pack up the family, and here we go again. So that's, that's what brought me down to this area. What was your first feud in this area in Mid-Atlantic? You probably know better than I do. I don't remember yesterday too well. I'm thinking Ricky Steamboat. Oh, Ricky Steamboat. That dog's still around? <laughs> uh, yeah, possibly the Ricky Steamboat, yeah. What were your impressions of Ricky Steamboat as a, when he was first starting out? I mean, he had been, he'd been here a couple of years, I guess, but when you were well, first around Rick Steamboat, what were your first impressions of him? Well, he's a good athlete. I'd, I'd seen him up in, uh, in the Minneapolis territory where he broke in, and he was a rookie, and uh, he looked, uh, he was very impressive as an athlete, but, uh, you know, who knew about his charisma? He didn't do interviews or anything up there, and, and uh, when I came here, he was just already over sensational. He, was, he had this ton of charisma. He just projected himself so well to the people and his style and athleticism he was uh, he was a great performer by the time I, I met him again you got paired up with Greg Valentine yes Greg the hammer one of my favorite guys what are your what were your memories of that run tagging with Greg Valentine very good we got we got lost on the Schloss and cutoff once in a while but uh, yeah Greg Greg was a great guy and uh, we had a we had a good run Memories of teaming with Greg Valentine against Paul Orndorff and Jimmy Snuka. Well, they they uh, they came into the uh, territory and they were sensational. Jimmy Snuka could fly and jump, and Paul Orndorff has this tremendous physical presence and uh, uh, good athlete. But at the time, he wasn't uh, uh, seasoned, whereas Jimmy Snuka was a seasoned veteran and he knew what he was doing. And Paul was following him. He kind of liked Mad Dog and I when I went with him up to New York. And we could tell that, but uh, in the ring, it was uh, good. But uh, uh, Jimmy Snuka, used, he would climb the top, top to the top corner after a certain situation, and he'd sl slam us, or Paul Under would drop kick us, and one of us would get up, and Snuka would be up on that top rope, and he'd fly across the ring. And I'm, he was flying probably 15 feet, 10, 12 feet, whatever it was, way up high. And he whoa. And at the time, he was uh, weighing about 250, 60 pounds. He was pretty big when he came into the territory. And whoa, down you'd go, and boom, you'd hit the mat. And, you know, the first, uh, first two or three weeks, you know, Greg was catching him a lot. And Greg said, I can't do it, I can't do it. So then I had to catch him the rest of the time, and it was... It got to be quite a, quite a scary thing to see Jimmy coming. What circumstances led from you teaming with Greg Valentine to you teaming with Paul Jones? Oh, just, uh, uh, well, I, I don't know exactly what the circumstances were. I was just uh, working the territory, making the towns as best I could. And uh, I think Greg had gone. Uh, I think he was involved with a Wahoo feud or something. I'm not. Did Wahoo? Did Would he break that Wahoo's have been leg? The, I broke Wahoo's leg. Yeah, he broke Wahoo's leg, and he went off with uh, with that tangent. And I was kind of, you know, just spinning my wheels, doing, you know, whatever I did with other people. And then uh, Paul Jones had uh, was kind of drifting too, you know, and and. 
somebody, uh, I'd gone to Japan and I came back and the next thing I knew they said, uh, uh, we want you to Paul, team up with Paul. And, and you know, I'd seen Paul around this, that and the other and actually worked against him several times. And Okay, why not, you know, and uh, it was one of those uh, physical things too. It was, uh, he had a style and I had a style and he looks a certain way and I look a certain way and, and it was like uh, one of those magical moments it just kind of worked out really well and uh, I think we made a really good team. What were your impressions of Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood? As a <coughs> they were sensational. Everybody loved them. They were great. They could fly around the ring. They could do a lot of things athletically and uh, and uh, Paul and I could slap them around. It was great. When you and Paul Jones split the team, was that your first real experience working babyface? Hmm. I believe it was. Yes. What was that like? Something a, a new, a new sort of persona, a new thing to try. Well, I didn't change, but uh, it was just a timing thing. I just changed my timing and. Uh, uh, I let my inner self come out. What led you to Georgia from Mid-Atlantic? Uh, it, was, it was about time for me to leave, I guess, and I, I thought I'd give, it was, Georgia was the next closest territory to where I live in Charlotte, so I was uh, commuting to uh, Georgia, and uh, about that time I needed uh, a couple of shoulder operations anyway, so there was a doctor there that that was supposed to be pretty good, and uh, eventually I had my, both my shoulders operated on. So that's kind of the motivation, you know. Any good stories from living in Charlotte when, when that territory was kind of on the rise? It hadn't really peaked yet like it would later on, but any, like, memories of living in Charlotte and, and being just kind of in this area? Oh, just in Charlotte? Yeah. Charlotte was, uh, you're talking about Charlotte now? Yes, sir. Charlotte was uh, hot when I was here. I mean, it was hot before I got here, and it got even hotter after I was here. So it was it always just kept building and building, building and building and building. And, building. and then the, uh, it was, and it was hot when I left. I mean, you had guys like uh, Flair and Wahoo, and uh, before that, Valiant, uh, Valentine, and everybody that was here was just sensational, and they were they were drawing big houses and making making tons of money. So. Did you meet Flair here, or had you met him in Minnesota when he was no, at Burns actually, Camp? Actually, I, I missed. <laughs> actually, he was at that camp too. I met, didn't mention his name before. Yeah, actually, I had one of his first matches in Minneapolis just before he left. What did you think of him at that time, just starting out? He was uh, adequate, which was good. You know, for a, a rookie, he was he was he was good. And he, by the time I got, you know, two or three years later when I came back came down here, he was. Uh, he was uh, just great. He was, you know, he was Ric Flair. He'd he'd gotten, uh, you know, from be, being a muscle. He had trimmed down a lot. He had trimmed down quite a bit from being a bulky muscle guy down to what he became as a, as a worker and smooth and and uh, just an excellent worker. He had improved a lot and he was he was very good. He had, plus, he'd gotten the long bleached hair and. The, the attitude and the whole thing, and it, it worked for him great. Was there anyone else along those same lines that you saw come through Vern's camp in, in Minnesota and were really kind of impressed with early on? Well, Steamboat and uh, uh, Chris Taylor was Chris Taylor, but uh, Ken Patera turned out to be a great worker. Uh, uh, Kazro Vaziri, the Sheik of New York. He never quite got up to snuff as far as work, but he was, he drew a lot of money. He was so a character. You say? Yeah, good character. Uh, right guy at the right time. Uh, they produced a lot of great workers. When, you said when you started out, Vern didn't so much have a camp, it was kind of just you, so there was no one else that would have started out. You know, you always hear about Flair and Patera and Steamboat kind of being in the same class. Well, they were in a, they, they, they were a group that was in a camp and, uh, he had brought Billy Robinson over from England, and Robinson put him through the paces, and uh, uh, so they had a real tough time uh, 
probably more so than I did. But I was back then I was in great shape, so it wouldn't probably bother me too much. But before before he had that that camp, Vern had, had broken in different people at different times, but it was always just one guy at a time. You know, one year this guy and one year this guy. When I was one of the lucky ones that did it one on one with Vern. You think it was tougher in the camps? Uh, I have no idea. I mean, I didn't. They didn't make it uh, like easy for me. I had to run and do calisthenics and do all. That. But I had been doing it all my life, so it, it wasn't. You know, I wasn't. I wasn't going to barf because somebody made me do a few push-ups. In the early '80s, you got the chance to wrestle in Germany and in Austria. What was it like for you as the Baron to wrestle in Germany? It was great. For some reason, they didn't like me at all. I can't imagine why. I don't know why. Here I am, a native son. They were intimidated home. by your good looks, is yeah. exactly what it was. Exactly. See, you know, now you're catching on, Brad. Yeah. I like that. Uh, uh, I went over there, and uh, of course, I was uh, Baron von Raschke, and uh, they, they assumed that I was a pretender to the throne, I think. They didn't think I was, you know, they kind of thought I was from uh, the United States and was not really one of them. And we played up to that, and they didn't like me a lot, so it got over good. Were you apprehensive to be in Germany doing doing the Baron, or was it was it just another experience? It was just not, uh, to me. It was just another experience. I, I was uh, doing what I love to do, and uh, uh, working is that's that's what you do. You uh, adapt to different things, and when you're in Japan, you have to work a certain way. When you're in Germany, you have to work. And some of some the guys, they go to these places and they can't adapt and they, they get a little lost. I mean, they, they're great workers and things here, but sometimes some of them, you know, don't, don't, don't catch on. What was the style like in Germany at the time, co comparable to how it would be in the United States? Well, they like uh, more, uh, more uh, wrestling holes, like amateur wrestling holes and things like that. It's built on that. And... Uh, uh, I guess closer work. I say that, but it's not. That's not quite it. But it's uh, it's just a different style. Plus, they uh, wrestle in rounds, they three minute rounds, and or is it five minutes? Five minute rounds, and then you know you're supposed to stop and then start up again. And if you're smart, you don't stop, but you keep going. But How did you adapt to the round system? I was smart. I kept going, and uh, people didn't like me so. Promoters kept asking me back, so it must have worked. From there, you found yourself back in the AWA mm -hmm. in, I guess, the early 80s. How had, if at all, how had the territory changed from, from when you first broke in and when you had been there before to what it was like in the early 80s? Well, it had gotten bigger, actually. It expanded to, uh, uh, before it was like Chicago, Minneapolis, Winnipeg, uh, Omaha, Denver, and then but when I went back, it was all those towns plus uh, uh, Salt Lake City, and eventually they went to Frisco, and uh, it had just gotten bigger, and and uh, there was more travel, so uh, it was a bigger territory. Had Vern changed in your impression of him, or had he was he pretty much the same? No, he's still a good businessman. I mean, he uh, he he. he uh, uh, I, don't, I don't see that he had changed at all. He was the way he was from the first that I'd met him. How involved was Greg Gagne behind the scenes at this point in, I guess, early 80s when you first got back? Well, Greg was uh, Vern's, he was at that camp too, by the way. Him and Jim Brunzel and Brunzel. And the high flyers. Yeah, and uh, both Greg and Jim were good workers. They turned out to be real good workers. Greg didn't have the physical uh, appearance that a lot of workers need, but he was, of course, uh, part of the promotion, so he, he did it quite well. But uh, he was uh, he was in the office. He was helping him book and do things. You know, he he was doing what promoter sons do. What were your memories of tag teaming with the Crusher? The Crusher. Uh, I had a lot of fun with Crush. He was a he was a good partner and a good uh, good friend. And, uh, he's real sick right now, so. But uh, uh, we 
we wrestled, uh, we had a run with the Road Warriors back when they first came into the territory and uh, they were all juiced up and weren't selling and, and running over people and Crusher had, was having a real problem with them. But, uh, uh, it worked out. We, we made it work out. Straight? Absolutely. Um, teaming with the Crusher, AWA World Tag Team Champions, what were your thoughts on being involved in the Road Warriors' first title win? They won? Yes. Oh! Unfortunately. Good thing you told me. Uh, you know, it was... Uh, they came in and they, 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 they took the territory like a storm, you know, with uh, Paul Ellering as their manager and these big guys and they wore the spiked suits and, uh, you know, uh, they were on top of their game and they just came in like a bulldozer and uh, so they won. What were your impressions of the Road Warriors at first? You mentioned that Crusher kind of didn't take to them at first. What were your impressions of them when they first came in? Well, they, you know, uh, I got along with them. They, they, uh, they uh, liked or respected or something, I don't know, but uh, they weren't bad with me, but uh, they, Crusher was, I don't think he, they respected him the way they did me, and uh, I don't know why. I, I never have understood that because, uh, Crusher had his way, but he was an established star, and he was, he he des he deserved their respect, and he they he, they they didn't give it to him. Uh, he stood up for himself. Uh, he stood up for himself, and he faced he he had a meeting with them, and uh, uh, after that, it was a lot better. But uh, at first, they they were just running over him, and uh, you know he was he, by then he was an older guy, and. Uh, it was, it was not a great situation as far as tag teams that had to wrestle each other this week and then next week and the next week, or this night, that night, and next night. So it wasn't a great situation, but it worked out. And uh, by the time the, the series was over, it was working out really good. Was there any apprehension on the Crusher's part to pass the belts on to the Road Warriors? Oh, I don't, I don't think so, you know. Uh, I've never been real possessive of belts myself, you know. To me, it's a pain to carry them in my bag. But uh, uh, no, I don't think so. I, you know, it's just business. You do business. And it was business. Talk a little bit about what Vern Gagne was like to work for in that era, or just in general. Impressions of Vern. You know, you've mentioned before about a shrewd businessman and a good businessman. What were your other impressions on Vern and how he was to work for in that territory? Well, Vern, you know, Vern was, uh, he was a great amateur wrestler, great football player. He was uh, a, a great professional way back before I got into business. And uh, uh, he has this, uh, he has a very competitive personality. He's very competitive and uh, uh, he expects people around him to be equally uh, trying to do the best they can, you know. And uh, so he, I guess I, what I'm trying to say is he has kind of high standards. But at the same time, at the, at the time that I started with Vern and Wally Carbo and Bill Casisto, Minneapolis was one of the best territories in the country and everybody wanted to go there. So they had all the top talent going through there all the time. And they paid fairly good and everything was working out great. So uh, in that respect, he was a good businessman. He expected a lot, but he, uh, and he's, a, he's a, a little explosive. His personality is that way. Uh, you get him away from the business, you'd love the guy. He's a, got a great personality, blah, 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 blah. But uh, business-wise, he's very, uh, Oh, demanding, I guess. Uh, that's probably a little strong, but he's, uh, he's a perfectionist, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So you either adapt to that or you go someplace else. What were your thoughts or impressions on Wally Carbo? I love Wally. <laughs> he's one of the funniest men in the world, and uh, uh, 
When I was in the Army, I, we used to work out at uh, West Point. They'd have the all-Army team up there working out, and then we'd wrestle various tournaments and stuff. And every spring, they would have the uh, New York Yankees and the New York Mets come up and play the cadets. And so we'd be in the same, uh, same dressing room, although at the time I was too shy to talk to any of these people. But uh, uh, Yogi Berra, Casey Stengel, and those people would be in the same dressing room. And you know Yogi Berra. Uh, yeah, yeah. All the sayings he has, and you know uh, Casey Stengel, uh, Steng uh, Stengelies, and you know, they would say these ridiculous things that everybody would have to go, what? What did he say? You know? And Wally Carver was the same way. He could, he could mix up words and say things, and, and he was just... Uh, but a very shrewd businessman, a very, uh, very funny guy, and just uh, a good guy, just kind of... I loved Wally. Everybody liked Wally. What was the attitude like, morale like, in the AWA locker room around 84, 85, when Vince McMahon was really starting to, to grow his business and try to take it national? What was the attitude of the boys like in the AWA locker room around that time? Well, the guys, uh, the guys on steroids were really, really uptight because they didn't know exactly when Vince would call. <laughs> so they, they could hardly wait till Vince called. Hulk said, please call me, please call me. The road boys, please call me, please call me. So those, the steroid guys were, up, they were uptight. You know, and uh, I'm not telling them anything out of school, but... Uh, Eventually, they all went with Vince, and some of the other guys went with Vince, too. And, uh, of course, um, Bobby Heenan never took a steroid in his life, so that's a plus. But anyway, uh, they were just anxious to go to, uh, to be with Vince because he had apparently sold him this bill of goods, and, you know, it worked out for him, so more power to him. But uh, at the time, Hulk left, and uh, Road Warriors left, everybody left, and then... Uh, that particular year, the AWA had the best year it ever had, money-wise. And so, you know, what can I say? I don't know. I, I, dressing rooms are dressing rooms, you know. You get guys that, that are taking stuff and doing stuff that uh, some of us don't do and, and don't understand. But, you know, one day they come in, hey, how you doing? Good guy. Hey. Hey. Next night, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't even talk to the guy, you know, so. That made, it, that made it tough. I don't think it was the dressing room. I don't think it was, uh, I don't think it was the guys themselves, but their uh, things they were doing was changing their personalities a little bit. Made, that made it tough. But I think it made it tough. You know, I went to New York after that, too, and uh, that wasn't a fun place, dressing room, either. Trust, trust me. He fed, Vince McMahon Jr. fed you good at those TV deals, but the dressing room wasn't the best place to be, you know, the... I was there one night when the Rujos uh, beat up the British Bulldogs and busted the guy's teeth out. Dynamite Kid wrote about that in his book. Did he? I don't know. I didn't read his book. But uh, I was there that night, and the guy came out and went, I'm kidding. Well, you know, he was uh, Jacques' son, Jacques Sr.'s son, and, and Jacques Sr. had been a pretty good boxer in his day, so what do you expect? But anyway... Um, prior to wh when you were there in, in 88, which we'll get In the AWA, there. nobody got in a fight anyway. Go ahead. In, in prior to when you were there in 88, which we'll get to in a little bit, had you ever had any discussions with New York when in the 80s when Vince was starting to expand and he was pulling guys like Heenan and Hogan? Had you crossed paths at all? No. Uh, he, uh, no, I, I had worked for Vince Sr. and I'd met uh, Junior at the time and... Uh, you know, I'm. Uh, what were your impressions of Junior then, when you met him? I guess in the '70s, when he was announcer, when he was just starting out. Oh, he was. You know, I didn't really pay too much attention to him. We, we would go do TV in uh, Philly, and then uh, what was the other town? Well, the second town we did uh, TV, and then uh, Vince would always take the the guys out for a meal, and. Uh, We'd sit around a table, and Vince Jr. would be there, and uh, we just, 
Vince's son, you know, he was not that important to me, to, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And I didn't pay that much attention to him. I knew who he was, and he probably knew who I was, and that was it. You know, he could interview me, and I did do whatever I did. And what were your impressions of Hogan early on when he was in the AWA? Just another guy. I don't know. He's a big guy, and... Uh, uh, did you think not he really would, not really a good worker? Did you think he would go on to be the draw that he would become? I uh, never thought about it, but yeah, he came to the uh, he came to AWA to be a heel, and he, he you know he just couldn't he didn't have the experience or the wherewithal to be a heel, so he uh, he was failing miserable. They they brought in uh, Johnny Valiant to be his manager and. Even with a manager, he couldn't get over as a heel. And so out of desperation, they turned him to a baby face. And they'd give him uh, two or three guys to beat on TV. And, you know, I mean, if you get a push like that, you got to be eventually get over, regardless of who you are. So he did. He got over, and he's more power to him. He's made a lot more money than I ever did. What led to you coming back to the Carolinas for Jim Crockett? in 86 to fill in for Crusher Khrushchev when Khrushchev went down with the knee injury. How did you get mixed in with the Koloffs in that run? Well, I'd taken a year off to watch my son play football and uh, being desperate for cash, I needed to go to work. So I called my old friend Dusty Rhodes who was booking uh, the Carolinas at the time and, and uh, uh, Crusher had just Busted his knee the week before, I think, or a few days before I called, and it just happened to be one of those <laughs> coincidental things. And Dusty thought I'd fit right in with him, so there I came, and it, it worked. It was it was good. What were your impressions of working with Ivan and Nikita? Oh, great! I love I, you know I love Ivan from years ago. You know, even I worked with Ivan back in Montreal when I, he came in after I'd left, and I went back and worked with him a few times. It was great. Uh, he's one of my favorite guys, a real good guy, and uh, I got to know and like Nikita real well too. We travel a lot together. It was a, it was a good good time. What and did there you? again, we worked with the Road Warriors a lot, who had who settled down and they were starting to be good, much better workers. What were your thoughts on uh, the '86 Crockett Cup at the Superdome, teaming with Barbarian, the kind of the big interpromotional tag tournament? kind of sort of trying to compete with Vince, you know, a little bit as far as getting everybody together under one roof like that. Well, I, you know, it was another match to me, but uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was just one of those things that uh, it was a big match. It was exciting at the time, but you know, I got a I got a payday. That's about it. You know, I, I I really don't have any big emotional attachment attachment to right, it at all. Right. Um, I like the barbarian a lot, by the way. Memories of being in the army with Paul Jones and Barbarian and Shaska and T.J. Khan and that whole brigade. That was again very interesting, and you know, I I was working and. They were all good guys, and we had uh, some good trips together. I always have a lot of fun with Paul Jones. I was going to say, how did it feel to be back with Paul, this time as a manager? Yeah, I, I, Paul and I always got along good. He, uh, if you get to know him on a personal basis, he's one of the funniest guys in the world. He's, always, he's witty, he's charming, he's great, and uh, we, we just get, we get along good. Still a good friend of mine. Memories of, uh, I guess, Paul Jones's program that he's most known for here in the Carolinas was the long feud with Jimmy Valiant. What were your memories of the Army feuding with Jimmy Valiant in the 80s through the Great American Bashes and, and all that? All exciting, good, fun things, you know. You know, Jimmy was, Jimmy was there and he's, uh, you know, he's, uh, he has his little hip-hop talk and, uh, uh, 
Hall was doing his best to get, get him run out of the territory, I guess. I don't know. What led to you in the WWF finally in 1988 managing Warlord and Barbarian? What were the circumstances that, that got you there and, and as a manager instead of a wrestler? Well, they called me and they told me to come in. And of course, I'd been over as Baron Von Raschke almost all of my career. When I was, back when I was Jimmy Raschke from Nebraska, nobody cared. When I became the Baron, people started to care, and they got, got bigger and bigger. So, you know, I had like 25, four, three years, whatever it was, in the business as Baron Von Raschke, and the claw was pretty much most of that experience. And uh, they came in, and they, they, uh, they brought me in. They had, had a different idea. They had me wear a different kind of robe, and they had me uh, paint my face, and which I thought was kind of comical anyway, but uh, I thought it was comical when the Road Warriors did it, but it got over for them. Uh, anyway, uh, it was just a... Uh, oh, and they were telling me what to say and uh, different things. It was just uh, it was just a... Uh, you know, it was... Uh, Bobby Heenan, you know, years ago, he, uh, he had some difficulty with the, uh, Larry Hainimi, which you would know as... Uh, one of the Andersons. Which one is he? Lars? Huh? Be, yeah. yeah, Lars Anderson. And we'd be riding in the car together, Bobby and I, going on our own. He said, you know, Baron, I'd like to become a promoter. I said, really? Why? Well, if I was a promoter, I'd like to have my territory, and I'd call Lars Anderson have him fly in, and then I'd fire him. <laughs> so I think that's what Vince McMahon, he must have had that same conversation with somebody else. So he flew me in just to fire me, I don't know. I, I went in there two or three times, and then he, he, he let me go without telling me I was fired, which was kind of, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I didn't appreciate it, so I, I kept bugging him and calling and calling and calling. Finally, uh, he had to, wherewithal to answer the phone and uh, let me know that my services were no longer necessary. But uh, he, didn't have the, he didn't have the courage to come up to me man to man and say, we don't need you anymore. So there you go. Why do you think the run was so short in WWE? Oh, they had a different idea, I guess. Uh, they wanted to... Uh, uh, or it was just the, the towers. Baron, the what was it? The towers the of pain. Of pain. Uh, uh, Barbarian and, and was it Kaczynski? Warlord. Yeah, Warlord. Uh, they wanted them. Did they change them to babies or what? They they came in as babies and were going to be kind of the road warrior type thing in New yeah, York, and yeah. then it they, didn't they really work. They started painting they, their faces, and they wanted me to paint my face. And yeah, it just wasn't. Uh, wasn't it wasn't me doing what I do, you know. Uh, Vince does that. He gives everybody their, their characters, and, you know, he reads comic books or whatever he does. And, you know, back, back when I was starting the business, you, you met a guy like Mad Dog, he was Mad Dog. You met Crusher, he was Crusher. You met the Moose, he was the Moose. You know, it was, these, these were guys that were coming from, the, that was coming from, the, that was their character coming from inside. And when I was a Baron, you know, that's, that's probably really me. When you went back to the AWA, the territory was really kind of on its last legs in like 88, 89, 90. What were your, your impressions of being there towards the end of the territory? Well, it was, uh, it was sad, you know. Was, you, were, you could see it going down, 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 and nobody, nobody seemed to know what to do. And, they kept trying to compete with the WWF on their terms rather than doing what they did best, which was wrestling. And uh, they tried to make it too much show business. You know, everybody had to have a had to have a song to be introduced. Da -da, da -da, da -da, you know, rock and roll. And uh, everybody had to have a rock and roll song to be introduced. They started introducing the guys before they got to the ring. It was it was the whole TV production thing, but they did it every night, like. 
the WWF does, WWF. And uh, it was, uh, they were copying rather than doing what they should have done, which was stick to their guns and do what they did best. But the AWA was the only one that did it. Crockett did it too, and a lot of them did it. You may have you may have just answered this, but kind of sum up in your words. Why do you think the AWA went under? Well, I think they were they were trying to play catch up, or thought they were. And they were trying to do things. That, uh, they were trying to emulate what uh, McMahon Jr. had started, and uh, they either didn't have the expertise, or they didn't spend the kind of money that he did in getting the. Uh, Right people, you know, in production. I don't know. I don't know exactly. I, I was never in that end of the business. I was always a, a worker. They were the promoters and the producers, and and I just I just went out and did the best I could do in the ring and with the information I had. And that was it. What were your thoughts on the Team Challenge series that the AWA ran, where the whole roster was split into the three teams? You were captain of one. Hey, Brad, you know I don't think about this stuff that much. I just show up. Uh, I thought it could have been a good, uh, it could have been a good, uh, good thing, you know. But they involved uh, they started off. It was a good concept. They just uh, got away from the concept a little bit, and it was it got to be so that they were featuring some lesser talents where they could have featured some better talents. So. Hey, but who knows? You know, you try things and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Do you think Vern was out of touch with the scene of wrestling in the 80s and where wrestling was headed? Well, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, the WW, what is it called? E? e. Yes. And they're still in business and Vern isn't, so what, what, what can I say? Any recollections as far as what the morale and the atmosphere was like as the AWA was going under? I did the boys pretty much know that, that the territory was on its last legs or Well uh They were they yeah, the talent wasn't coming in that had been there and uh uh it was uh I really shouldn't say that because they did have some good talent because the WWE kept stealing it from them. So, uh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, the, the uh, towns weren't drawing, so of course everybody knew that things weren't quite what they should be. Yeah. The, the WWE was running the same towns. They were buying TVs, and, and Vern was persisting in running his shows, and... Uh, and uh, not paying the TVs, and of course the TVs lost interest in that because they figured that the dumb guy from uh, Connecticut could would pay him X amount of dollars to put his TV dumb TV show on their station, so we'll take the money. So he did, and then he'd run a he'd run a town, and he'd pack the he'd pack the card, and uh, you know give away a lot of free tickets, so it looked like he was sold out, and they'd have a good. TV production, and you make a lot of money off that. So he, yeah, he had a he had a different vision for the business, and uh, the other guys just the other promoters just kind of want to keep running it the way they had been, in my estimation. And I'm not an expert, trust me. Being trained by Vern Gagne, did you feel an attachment to the AWA in particular? Were you sad to see it go? Being more than just a company, did you feel an attachment to the company? Being kind of a homegrown talent there? No. I mean, it was, uh, I, I think I've mentioned this before. To me, it's a business. I'm, I'm in a business, and I worked for uh, Vern Gagne. I worked for Jimmy Crockett. I worked for Vincent Mann. I worked for Johnny Rougeau. I worked for Fritz von Erich. I worked for Eddie Farhat. I worked for these people, and they're my bosses. When I worked in college, when I worked in construction, I worked for different companies, and I did my job the best I could, and and uh, you know I wasn't emotionally attached to any, any of them. But uh, I, I think it, I think uh, wrestling uh, as 
we knew it as, as uh, more or less disappeared from the, the uh, big view or big picture. There are still little pockets of it here and there. But, uh, so Vince changed it a lot. But, uh, and it's kind of sad that the guys don't have places to go to work and stuff, yeah. That, that, that saddens me, but as far as individual promotions, uh, I don't feel good about it, but I don't feel, I'm not emotionally attached. What do you make of the trend that's prevalent in wrestling now for, for the, the nostalgia shows, the fan conventions like what we're at now, Legends of Wrestling, the video game, which you were in the second one, um, you know, WWE and their video games now, they have the legends as hidden characters that you can unlock. There seems to be a really big trend of guys that were big 20, 30 years ago are big now. What do you make of that as someone who kind of lived, you know, the scene back then? We must have done something right. People still remember a lot of the uh, old timers and, uh, and uh, well, they should because they were, they were, they were really good. There were a lot of really, really, really good talents out there, you know, and, and uh, God bless them. I, I hope things like this keep, uh, keep happening and continue and uh, it gives a chance for the, uh, some of the guys that have uh, been out of the scene for a while to come out and meet fans. And, and you know, uh, there isn't a day that goes by that somebody doesn't come and say, boy, you gave me a lot of pleasure, you know, you know just, uh, I get, I get those warm fuzzies all the time, but it makes me feel good, you know, you, you know, just, uh, you know, it just, uh, it's a good thing, I think. Tell us about what the Baron's been doing in life after wrestling. You've been out of the business for a number of years now. What well, are you up to now? Well, uh, for a number of years, uh, my wife and I, Mrs. Claw and myself, uh, moved from uh, the Minneapolis area up to northern Minnesota and we ran a gift and souvenir shop and that was uh, a lot of fun, uh, very cold. <laughs> you get out of Minneapolis it gets cold up north but, uh, uh, and then, but then we, uh, we wanted to be closer to our children who live in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul area and uh, one lives in Minneapolis one lives in St. Paul. So we decided to move closer to them, and so we sold that. We moved south, and uh, I was also substitute teaching in school. And uh, when we moved, I, I stopped substituting, and uh, we've been just uh, kicking back and making a few appearances here and there. Any any instances or stories of kids recognizing you, or being recognized as as Baron von Raschke in your like in your teaching experiences? Oh yeah, well, especially when I. I, st I went back into teaching shortly after uh, finishing with the AWA. Actually, yeah, yeah. Shortly after, like within a minute, I was back <laughs> teaching, and I'd go into the schools, and I, you know, uh, being a substitute teacher, I teach. Uh, I'm licensed in, uh, from junior high on up to through high school, and uh, I'd go like to a junior high and. Uh, the first day, the kids would see me and they go, whoa, in the hallways and in, the, in my classroom and, you know, they would, boy, and the, the, then I would be signing autographs all day and da, 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 da. you know, and everybody was just, they were in total shock and awe and because of the TV exposure and this, that, and the other. So then after, uh, after a few weeks, I was just Mr. Rashke just like any other teacher, and they were doing what they were doing, and I was, you kids, will, you will learn and you will like it, and that is all the people need to know. <laughs> and they still wouldn't pay attention. But anyway, so five or six years down the road, I would go to these same or different schools, and I'd be there, be there and uh, the uh, first couple of times I'd be there, a, a new school year I'm talking about, and I'd go in there and the uh, first day or two, you know, I'd introduce myself and blah, blah, blah. And three or four days later, the, my dad remembers you, my mom remembers you, you know, and they would go back and say this big guy with funny ears was my teacher, and then they'd say his name is Rashke, 
And then the parents would say, you mean the wrestler? And the kid, I don't know. And then, you know, and then they'd come back to me and they'd find out that I was a wrestler. And so then I'd get that whole thing again of, of signing autographs for the dad, of course, or the mom, and sign the autographs for about two or three weeks. Then back to being old Mr. Rashke, one of the teachers, you know. So. But that's how it, that's how it kind of went up and down. And yeah, I still get recognized, but now, now it's secondary. What, if, if anything, is your impression, the state of the business today? You come across as someone very much removed from wrestling now. What do you, you feel about the state of the business today? Well, I, th I think I answered that before. I think it's too bad that uh, uh, some of the young guys coming up, there, there are a lot of guys that still have the desire to, to break into the business and be in the business, and, and they just don't have a place to, places to work, you know? But uh, now, now again, I say that, but now again, there are some places to work. They, they're, they're finding that some of that old stuff does still draw crowds at certain times and certain places, and if it's done right. And uh, I've, I've been to some of these cards and some of these uh, unknowns who may never get known because they don't have TV exposure are doing a really good job. They're really, really pretty good. You made a, a very rare appearance at a show last year. You were, you made an appearance at Ring of Honor when they were in, I believe, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and yeah. and did a little did a little spot there. What were your impressions of that group? Did you stay and, and catch any of the show, or just kind of in and out? Yeah, I watched the whole show, and uh, their guys were pretty good. They were, they did really good good work. I thought. I thought I I was uh, I was impressed by the the. Uh, professionalism of, the, of that group. Bobby the Brain Heenan, in his first book, had a quote on Baron Von Raschke. He's the lies, all lies! He's the best worker in the world because he made people mad, yet he does not have one mean bone in his body. What is your thought on that? I fooled Bobby again. <laughs> uh, I do, I, you know, I... I learned the business and I do my work and I do it so I excite the people whether I'm a quote heel or a blue eye, baby face. And I do it, if I'm a heel, I do it a certain way. If I'm a baby face, I do it a certain way. The time, well, all it is is changing the timing a little bit of what I do and when I do it. So uh, uh, it's a business and I'm not mad at the guy I'm, I'm in the ring with. I'm not mad at uh, anybody. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do, and I'm doing it to the best of my ability. And it gives me a chance for the inner me to come out and express myself. Because I hate everybody, regardless of race, creed, or color, regardless of what Bobby Heenan says. I made that up. No, I didn't. It's a little any, any favorite road stories, the camaraderie among the boys, anything in your travels that stands out, or, or good ribs that you were a part of or saw? I didn't rib people, and uh, most people didn't rib me, so, but I, I've seen them and I've heard of them, and uh, there are a lot of great stories out there, so uh, uh, the camaraderie is, is just, was just tremendous. Uh, you know, you get a car, a car with four guys from different backgrounds, three or four guys, and uh, it's just amazing how you how you how you meld together. You know, usually, uh, usually uh, wrestlers got along pretty good. I've only seen a couple of fights in dressing rooms. So, one was in uh, Akron, Ohio, and one was in some place in Connecticut when uh, the Rougeau brothers Rougeau hit the bulldog. One of them. Favorite people to work with, as opponents or as partners or as managers, anything? Oh, so many, so many, so many. It's just, uh, they're an amazing number. Bruiser and Snyder are great. Johnny Rougeau was great. Uh, of course, Mad Dog is a partner. Horse Hoffman is a partner. Valentine is a partner. Jones is a partner. Murdoch is a partner. Rhodes is a partner. I had a lot of partners. Crusher as a partner. Uh, working against the Crusher was great. 
Working against uh, Murdoch was great. Working against Rhodes was great. Uh, Mobile Brazil was great. Uh, Ernie Ladd was great. Uh, just so many. I, you know, it's just uh, Bruno was great. Just, uh, just Pat O'Connor. You know, just uh, Luthez. I worked against Luthez. He was great. And uh, you know, I just Rick Flair, of course, Steamboat, uh, Snuka. Orndorff, they were all great. Favorite opponent, or opponent maybe you felt you had the most chemistry with? Uh, 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 I didn't like any of them. Uh, I, I, that would be really too hard to pick out. It's just, there are so many great ones. It's, if I picked out one, then they, all the others would be mad. Uh, Pat O'Connor comes to mind, but uh, he was he, him and I always had a symbiote. Oh, Johnny Weaver. I mean, guys like that. I don't know. Favorite matches or moments that really stand out as being something that that felt special. Ah, oh, Dory Funk Jr. in St. Louis for the title. That was that was a that was a great match. In my estimation, what he says, I don't know. Um, in closing, I guess just a little word association. I'll say a name and, and just the first couple of words that come to your mind. Um, Vern Gagne. Good businessman. Wally Carbo. Funny guy. Dick the Bruiser. Rugged guy. Crusher. Uh... He's the crusher. He's a, a beer drinking. He puts beer on his Wheaties. Did you know that? I did not know that. Yeah, that's what he said. But uh, actually, he doesn't drink beer. He drinks uh, cheap champagne. But go ahead. Uh, the Road Warriors. Uh, uh, a great, great team. Vince Senior. Uh, he, uh, he had a big territory with a lot of, uh, population. Vince Jr. He has a bigger territory with more population. <laughs> Bruno. Now, I'm not saying they were great promoters. Right. Okay. Bruno's just a good guy. Good, uh, down-to-earth person. Paul Jones. Uh, also a, a good guy, funny guy, a lot of wit. Rick Steamboat. Great guy. Luthez. A gentleman and a credit to the business at all times. Pat O'Connor. Uh, really good worker and a great performer and a good friend. Rick Flair. He's a wild man. Great worker and a good friend. Ivan Koloff. Great worker, a hard worker, hard, hard worker, and uh, still going strong. Baron Von Raschke. Who's that? Uh, just a guy that uh, tried to do the best he could and please as many people as he could with his work, and that was the Baron. Are there any wrestlers that you're still close friends with today? Oh, sure. Uh, but you don't know them. <laughs> uh, sure, I, I, I'm still friends with uh, Rock and Roll Zoom Off, Bobby Heenan, uh, uh, Joel Laurinaitis, who's one of the Road Warriors. Uh, his son plays for Ohio State. Um, uh, Larry Hennig and uh, Jim Brunzel. Yeah, a lot of them. What were your impressions of the Hennings? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see a lot of uh, guys that I, I really like at this uh, event in the next day or so. Uh, what were your impressions of the Hennings? Larry and then Kurt, the, the, his son that came along after him. Well, Larry and I go back a long way. You know, I was a, I was a rookie. Well, I, 
he was an established star. With him and the Harley Race were a, the tag team in the Minneapolis Territory when I started as a ring man. And uh, you know, I was I was down there pounding bolts into the ring and laying the plywood down, covering it with canvas. And Larry would come along and says, "College education, huh, kid?" Things like that. He's a, he's a he's a funny guy and a nice guy, big big rugged guy. And later I got to uh, meet Kurt, who was him and I were just got along great from the day we met, and he was. He was always, uh, he thought I said funny things, so he'd stick around and every once in a while I'd say something that he thought was funny, so uh, I appreciated that because somebody laughed, finally laughed at one of my jokes. But, uh, uh, and Kurt turned out to be just a tremendous worker. Good guy, good family man, great worker. And, you know. They're, they're all good people. I, I know Larry and his wife Irene and, and Kurt, and, uh, and it's just a tragic loss of what happened to Kurt. Any parting thoughts, closing words for your fans, fans watching this at home, people that have watched you work over the years? Well, I hope you enjoyed this, me making a fool of myself, and that is all!